I don't mean to say I am perfect. I haven't learned all I should, even yet. But I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. So, dear brothers, you have no obligations whatever to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. This will be a longer message. I decided to make it as long as necessary instead of abbreviating it to fit into one shorter video. I have something to say and I'm not at a typical Sunday morning church service where I'm forced to be on a timed schedule. So I will feel free to take as long as it takes. I have divided this message into four parts to make it easier to watch and to listen to instead of possibly tiring the viewer with one very long video. Still, all four parts make up the one message. I have noticed something. A very high percentage of the time that I ever point out something that might possibly be wrong with a fellow Christian, I am met not with acceptance, but with excuses. It is like playing catch with someone. You throw the ball back and forth between you. If they drop the ball, and you say the obvious, that they dropped the ball, they do not respond by agreeing they dropped the ball. Instead, they say the sun was in their eyes, so they couldn't see the ball. Or, I threw the ball too high or too low. Or, the ball came too fast or too slow. Or, the ball slipped out of their hands because the ball is too slippery or whatever myriad of excuses for their dropping the ball, instead of simply saying, my bad, I dropped the ball. I don't know why that is difficult to say, other than if you have pride, that would be difficult to say. If you have pride, it would be difficult to say, my bad, I dropped the ball. Probably if one is afraid of something, it can be difficult to say. Personally, I have more respect for someone taking accountability than someone who is ready with excuses. I think if a person acknowledged they dropped the ball and then followed that up with an excuse, that might be better than leading with the excuse and never acknowledging they dropped the ball. I hope we can all say we dropped the ball when we dropped the ball. I recall saying I dropped the ball I recall saying I should have done better at catching the ball when it was the other person who dropped the ball just because I wanted to be peaceable with others and make them feel better by saying that I could do better as well and not leave the do better part resting solely on them, shouldering some of that burden. I'm not sure if that is right of me. Maybe I should have just let it rest solely on the person who did drop the ball. The Christian versions of excuses I hear are usually these. Maybe some will ring a bell. We're all human. Or, I'm not perfect. Or the more inclusive, nobody's perfect. Or, we all fall short. These statements are true and I want to emphasize that I realize they are true. But I want to equally emphasize, and maybe not equally emphasize, but emphasize even more, let's not use them to excuse chosen fleshly behavior or to make that behavior seem acceptable or not so bad. I don't want to hear excuses for the flesh, which then lowers the bar for how a Christian should live. Instead, we should raise the bar. We have the fallen flesh as a part of us until we die. That is understood. But do we not have the Spirit of God in us as well? I feel as if I hear more excuses for the flesh part of us, more than about the new creation part of us, the reborn part of us that we claim to have. I opened with this verse. I don't mean to say I am perfect. 
I haven't learned all I should even yet, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. That was Paul, and it sounds like he's saying he's not perfect. That excuse I so often hear from some Christians. The difference in how Paul is saying he is not perfect, however, is that he doesn't use it as an excuse. He doesn't just blurt out, I'm not perfect, and leave that sitting there as some kind of reason not to change or to not acknowledge a mistake. He follows up with that he keeps working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. He was striving to grow and be better. Also, the verse before that one says, So whatever it takes, I will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Sounds to me that Paul was committed to living as the new creation we are if we have received salvation through faith in Jesus. He said whatever it takes, Whatever it takes, he will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life. Seems to me this is radically different from the I'm not perfect excuse and attitude I have so often heard from some fellow Christians. Seems to me that excuse is used as a reason not to do whatever it takes to live in the fresh newness of life. This is an excuse for living in the flesh. Another excuse I hear quoted to me more often than scripture itself is, there is no perfect church. If I had a dollar for every time I have heard that one, I admit it is a pretty good excuse. It is a pretty effective excuse for anything wrong that might happen in the church. Isn't there any desire to become better than we are? Or are we comfortable with smoothing over any and all imperfections with the there is no perfect church excuse? If I hear that excuse one more time, I do not know how I will respond as it irritates me a great deal. It is like stating the obvious as if that's supposed to mean something and serve as a one-size-fits-all excuse for anything amiss in the church instead of addressing what is amiss. Imagine if every time you had a suggestion for someone or pointed out something amiss to someone, they said in reply, I'm not perfect. For example, one day you find yourself in a store with someone you know. Let's go so far as to say that they are your friend. You are in this store with your friend. You observe them seriously considering buying a certain kind of soda to drink. You say to them, don't drink that soda and make yourself sick because you are the one who remembered they felt sick anytime they drank it, even to the point of throwing up once and instead of listening to you, they go ahead and drink it, get sick, and then say, I'm not perfect. Then they go on to repeat the behavior, each time saying, I'm not perfect. It is senseless. I didn't instruct them not to drink the soda because I wanted to be a jerk or to deprive them of pleasure. I said it for their own benefit and to avoid a problem. Also, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm hoping they will use common sense. Lastly, not only are they not perfect, they are being stubborn and unwise. Perhaps they should say that next time. Instead of saying, I'm not perfect, just say, I'm being stubborn. That would be more accurate. That was a strange illustration about the soda, I know. It is a real life example. In actuality, they did listen to me, instructing them to not drink the soda again, but not before telling me, Yes, Mom. And it wasn't my child I was telling this to, although they were acting like one. I do not have a child, 
and in a way, I resent having to play mom to a grown adult. In fact, someone who is older than me, and being the voice of common sense. The commonest of common sense. Here we are talking about not drinking something that has repeatedly made them sick. This is not genius level stuff. Almost always I find resistance to instruction. When someone does listen to my instruction without a battle first and without excuses first or without snide comments after, I almost don't know how to handle it because it is so unusual. Even more unusual is someone coming to their senses on their own accord and then telling me they dropped the ball in some way. I have a lot of respect for someone who is mature and humble enough to do that. Just makes me feel like my attempts at helping are not worth the effort sometimes. Like maybe next time I should just let them go ahead and drink the soda and be sick. That would not be something I would like to have happen, but when my instruction is received poorly or is unappreciated, that's what I feel like doing sometimes. Just let them go ahead and get sick. I vividly recall on multiple occasions hearing someone loudly yell out in pain as they removed a plate or bowl from the microwave because it was too hot to handle. Their pain was so loudly expressed that it could make me jump because I was startled. After observing this for a while, I suggested they use a towel or something to take the thing out of the microwave so they wouldn't burn their hands. I thought that made sense, but apparently I was the only one who thought that made sense because this advice was not heeded and instead the excuse was, this microwave makes things too hot. I have been amazed at how anything else can be to blame for a problem instead of the person who is not using common sense. The microwave is not to blame here. It is you and your lack of common sense. I suppose the conventional oven makes things too hot as well. So you can blame the oven when you touch a thing that is 350 degrees, I guess. I could probably point out that the air pressure on a tire is low on a car and the car owner might tell me, no car is perfect. And I guess that is reason enough to leave a problem unchecked. That is the logic that is being used. Or lack of logic. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure, and will be at ease, without dread of disaster. <laughs>